Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and get started. Um, I've got a couple of pieces of business that we need to address before we start, uh, start on the, or finish up the cytoskeletal lecture. Uh, the first is office hours. Um, so just no fault of, of my own or your own, uh, we've got some issues with our two kids. They start a new school, they have no after school program. And so uh, we have a challenge getting, being here and being uh, at school to pick up my kids during office hours. So if any of you guys have tried to attend, you'll notice that it's been periodic whether I'm there or not. Uh, as a consequence, I'm just, I'm making an announcement now. I'll have to change my office hours. Uh, this week alone, um, I'm gonna have to change tomorrow's to like the only time I have is, um, is 8.30 to 10 in the morning, which I know is like the crack of dawn. Um, Jashan has been running them in the afternoon and Paige is gonna take over for him this week since he's got the Medcat, good luck. Um, and um, this Friday, I'll be able to do the four to five, but um, normally uh, that time will be, I'll, I'll be out picking up my kids from school. So I have to find another time on Friday uh, just to show a hands, uh, who's willing to come to early morning office hours? Like nine to 10, does that work for most people? In relation to the other office hours that the TAs are giving, does it give us some options? All right, we'll try it, and if I get a big major, major complaints, we'll try to adjust it again. I'd rather have a time that I can consistently show up so you guys can kind of count on me being there as opposed to getting a call and having to go pick up my kids and then having to make excuses for why I'm not at office hours, okay? All right, cool. All right, so the second order of business um, is addressing uh, or introducing to you guys the topic for, for this year's paper topic. Uh, hopefully you guys have been uh, working on team assembly. Is that correct? How are, we, how are we doing that this year? Do you want to get up and talk a little bit about team assembly this year? Yes, yeah, so I think we're randomizing. Is we are randomizing. Grouping based on like, performance. Gotcha, okay. So we've done it differently in different years. Uh, sometimes we'll let students self-assemble. The last few years we've been picking around with us randomizing. Uh, it sounds like uh, Dr. James decided to do that this year. Yeah, when do we want the team assignment? We're going to need the teams. We probably need the teams by, we have both quizzes. So I'll work with Paige and uh, we'll set up teams this week. Okay. okay. All right. So I'll introduce the idea today, the topic. You guys can be individually browsing the literature to figure out what the heck this thing is, uh, what some of the controversies are. So the way that um, Dr. James posted a number of examples, uh, a good bit of information on how to get started on this project, I strongly uh, recommend that you guys uh, look into that, uh, follow some of those links that he's provided, uh, I've announced this on CoLab. There is a link to uh, the NCBI gene bank. So it doesn't give you much information other than uh, where it comes from genomically. Uh, and start looking into this. So I'm going to introduce the topic today. Uh, we'll work with Paige and get teams assigned and announced on CoLab by Friday. So it gives you a little bit of time individually. And then you guys can work on it as a team. All right, so the topic for this year is this MTUS-1. It's also known as MTSG-1. Um, what is this, okay? Uh, so the name is uh, the microtubule associated scaffold protein one, okay? Its gene name is whenever you see it in italics, caps in italics, that's a human gene name, gene name. Okay, so that's the human gene name. The mouse gene name would be a capital M, lowercase T-U-S, I believe, uh, one would be the mouse name, okay? All right, so this protein contains a C-terminal domain that allows it to interact with the angiotensin II receptor. Uh, it has a large coil-coil region allowing dimerization. There are multiple alternatively spliced transcript variants encoding different isoforms that have been found for this gene. So it's one gene, 
but there are many different types of protein that come out because of the way that uh, splice variants work, okay? So you'll have to explore this. Um, it has a varied transcriptional profile. So if we look across organ systems, cell systems, the relative expression of this particular gene is varied across cell types. Uh, the way that these projects work is that we always wind up picking a topic where there's a bit of a controversy uh, regarding what it does or what role it plays in disease, and this is no different, okay? So the goal here is for you guys to work as a team, investigate this molecule, read the literature, try to understand what the field believes this protein does. In this particular case, you're gonna find they're kind of two camps. They're two different pathways that you might take for this paper, okay? Uh, and, and that's what we're looking for. There are lots of examples. We will have a, uh, like an exam review session, we'll also have a review session on the paper and kind of how to construct it. Um, and so there'll be, be more information coming along. Any questions that arise, come to the TAs or myself or Dr. James when he comes back uh, and we'll, we'll help you guys navigate, okay? All right. Okay. So I'm gonna close that up. All right. So today, my only goal is to finish out the cytoskeleton lecture. Uh, we're gonna. You should mention the exam review session beyond that. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, do we have a time? We don't have a time yet. So there will be. So next week, um, there's going to be an exam review session on Wednesday. Uh, the time is to be determined. Okay. Uh, so put that. At least put put a mental note that that we'll be posting that soon. Yeah. There is, so that's a great question. On the day of the exam, you also have a quiz. I know, it's wonky. Uh, the way it works is that, remember, you have about four quizzes over the course of a quarter, and you have the exam. They are independent of one another, right? So the reason that we do this is that the fourth quiz just coincides with when the exam is. If you take the fourth quiz, and let's say you have taken four quizzes and you've scored perfect, that's the extreme <laughs> example, right? Then there's absolutely no reason for you to sit in on the exam. Get up after 15 minutes, sayonara, you've got your score for quarter one. If you take the quiz and you do some quick math and you decide, you know what, I'm gonna sit and take a shot at the exam because maybe I'll score higher than my quiz average, then you stay and you take the exam, okay? Yes? Independent, okay. correct. So we are going to take all your quizzes, all four. We'll average them up. Let's say it's a uh, 95, right? Yeah, no, okay, not, maybe not quarter one, but maybe quarter four. We usually see things go up uh, over the course of term. And let's say you take the exam at the same time and that one you get an 87 on. We're gonna take the higher score. Vice versa, right? You take all the exams, you do lousy, you take the, the exam, I mean, excuse me, quizzes, you do lousy, you take the exam, score 92, like I, we're gonna take whatever is the highest. When quarter two starts, it's a clean slate, you start over again, okay? Yes? Is it multiple choice again, multiple quizzes, or? I believe they're all, uh, I'm gonna say no, they're not all multiple choice. There will be, I'm almost positive, at least in some of the exams, we'll either have a simple fill in the blank. Sometimes there is, obviously we've uh, talked about equations in this class, there might be a simple equation that you have to, that you have to solve and then write in a number. There's no short answer. There's no short answer though, right? No like sentences or paragraphs. Although don't we do some, we've done some um, extra credit sometimes that but they're not going to be more than like, what's that? It's not more than a sentence, right? Yeah. Yes. Um, so like, 
our metric at the end of each quarter is whichever one you score highest on. So if you're like, yep, this ain't working, <laughs> exam is done, obviously it is likely going to be the lower of the two scores. Okay? So that, it's, uh, that's a pretty easy choice. Right? Yes? Is this week's quiz just on all the cytoskeleton stuff and then the molecular motors production? Uh, so I'm going to give you guys a break because we ha we're not going to get into molecular motors at all today. That the molecular motors pre-lecture will not be on this quiz. So effectively, you guys got a huge pass because I was too verbose, and I better be careful before we do the same thing today. Uh, and it's only going to be effectively on the last bit of uh, the enzymes lecture, which is almost non-existent, and cytoskeleton. Okay? Yeah. Does that mean it's going to be on like that and the next two classes are going to be on the next quiz? The next quiz will be molecular motors and ECM. Okay? Which is, we just instead of having half the questions on molecular motors on one quiz and the other half on the other quiz, we'll just all go on to one quiz. But there won't be a change in the number of questions, just to make that clear. We, the quizzes are always seven or eight questions, right? So it'll be the same. Okay. All right, one last question, then I gotta get going, Russell. Oh, this is really fast, but we're gonna do our last quiz score before we take the exam, right? Yes, exactly. Yeah, we will close out that quiz, and then we'll do our last quiz score. Yeah, we will close out that quiz. You'll have access to those scores. You can make your number crunching. We'll give everybody a rest, and then we'll kick into the exam. So the exam's about one hour, right? And the quiz about 15. Okay. All right, any other questions like this? They're good? Bring them to me after class, or after lecture. All right, so let's finish up on cytoskeleton. So we have something to quiz you guys on Thursday. And where we left off uh, last week was uh, on this topic of microtubules uh, and GDPases. We got through this slide, but I'm just going to touch on it really quickly to remind you guys. All right, so microtubules are made up of uh, tubulin dimers. And if you remember, the dimers are uh, what we call GDPases. So these are enzymes that are going to convert GTP into GDP. They also happen to be the monomeric subunit of the polymer that's going to generate uh, the polymer that is microtubules. All right, so tubulin dimers are going to bind to GTP. That's a critical first step in their ability to form a polymer. Uh, once in the microtubule, the GTP is almost immediately hydrolyzed. Okay, the GDPase enzymatic activity of this monomer of microtubules is, um, is the conversion of GTP into GDP. All right? Remember we talked about the fact that the new tubulin GTP adds to the existing or growing microtubule, creating what we call a GTP cap. Okay? So the, the, you can think about the size of this cap is a function of both how fast monomers are being added and how fast the tubulin can hydrolyze that GTP, right? So if I'm adding monomers really, really fast, much faster than GTP can be hydrolyzed, then that cap's going to grow, right? The contrary is also true. If I stop, I'll get to it. If I stop polymerization, right, if I don't have available monomer, then the GTPase activity will dominate, and you'll start to lose that GTP cap. Why that is important is that the GTP, GTP cap, is a tongue twister, uh, has a much lower critical concentration than GDP bound tubulin. Okay? So what this sets up is this scenario that we talked about on Thursday called catastrophe or catastrophic disassembly. So if I stop growing that polymer, so GTP tubulin is no longer being added, now the GTP is hydrolyzed to GDP, you lose the cap, and the critical concentration goes up. Okay? It goes up usually above the concentration of monomer that's available. And so what that causes is disassembly. Okay? That's the slide before when we talk about polymerization dynamics. Okay. All right, so this in cartoon form. Here uh, we have this concept of dynamic instability, so growth followed by this loss of GTP cap leading to disassembly, 
release of monomers that then can add on to other polymers. So growth, disassembly, growth, disassembly, Cons consistently and constantly. All right, so a few rapidly disassembling microtubules will wind up feeding the growth of many slowly growing microtubules. And how that happens is so we have fiber number three here. We have a GTP cap on all of them. And let's say this one right here stops growing, which means that that GTP is converted in GDP. We lose the GTP cap, causes catastrophic disassembly or catastrophe. Those tubulin now will release their GDP and pick up a GTP. And I'll clarify that here in just a minute. Once they pick up that GTP, now they can participate in polymerization. So they will begin to add to these other growing polymers. All right, so I don't want to, I want to make sure that we're really clear on this uh, because a, a number of students will always get a little bit confused. We're going from tubulin that has a guanidine diphosphate now in this scenario to a tubulin that picks up, effectively picks up a phosphate group, right? It goes from guanidine diphosphate to guanidine triphosphate. And it's really easy to think that, oh, that's a kinase, right? There's some kind of kinase activity that adds a phosphate group. That is not the case for GTP aces. They will lose their GTP, so they'll shed it, and they'll be reloaded with a new GTP, okay? GTP is synthesized somewhere else in the cell, and there's an available pool that will then be reloaded, okay? There is an enzyme that helps facilitate that. It's called a guanidine exchange factor. It's not on here. I don't need you to know it. What I do need you to emphasize, or to have, I, what I need to emphasize, is that it's not a phosphorylation event. You're losing GDP and picking up a GTP. Okay. All right. And I think I showed this video, but just to do it again, you can see this is a real-time image of microtubule assembly and disassembly, and you can look at this a little bit um, and, and very easily see these slow growing fibers and then these catastrophic disassemblies. Yes? The tubular has to have GTP bound to it in order for it to start form, like adding to the polymer. Correct. Correct. Okay. Yes? Um, so you were saying like the tubulin dimer is what the GTP, GTP is, so when it's a monomer, is it not the GTP? So, base? yeah, so tubulin is in a dimeric form. Okay, this is, uh, this is just one of the nuances of biology. That dimer is the monomer. Does that make sense? So it's a dimer meaning it's composed of two subunits, right, of proteins that have come together to form a dimeric protein. Now that protein acts as a monomer for microtubules. Okay, yeah. So be, yeah, be careful about that. A lot of Proteins that form polymers are dimers or trimers themselves. The protein itself is, or the monomer, right, is itself. Okay? Levels of, yeah, this going on. Okay. All right. So where does this aspect of dynamic instability and catastrophic disassembly really come into play? And probably one of the most notable um, areas is in this concept of chromosomal segregation. So during mitosis, right, during cell division, we have to duplicate our entire <laughs> genome, and then we have to somehow separate it so that the two daughter cells each get one exact copy of the genome, okay? So during, um, in this case, during metaphase, so this is a, a cell under, undergoing mitosis, during metaphase, we're gonna have microtubules that assemble to connect and disassemble in order to help drive uh, or divide chromosomes during mitosis. Again, this is a part of uh, the mitotic spindle. So just some definitions here. Uh, you remember the microtubule organizing centers or MTOX. When we're in um, metaphase, when we're actually in mitosis, we call these spindle poles. So you'll see them the same thing. If you see spindle pole, that means it's an mTOC. It just happens to be in this phase of the cell's life cycle, okay? All right, so the spindle poles are the mTOCs. We have microtubules, right? This is the stabilizing zone. This is the negative end of the microtubules. They'll grow out and they'll connect then 
on either side uh, to the chromosome. Okay. All right. So the spindle microtubules, right? So these are microtubules. They're defined as spindle microtubules because they're part of the spindle pole system, okay? During, uh, during mitosis. The spindle microtubules, where's my mouse, uh, are linked to what is known as the centromere. It's this region right here uh, of the chromosome. It's a macromolecular structure that defines exactly where those microtubules are going to attach, right? Okay, and so uh, they're gonna be linked to the centromere of a chromosome through this structure. So it's a macromolecular structure known as the kinetic core. A lot, of, a lot of proteins comprise this macromolecular, you could almost call it a machine, right? This macromolecular complex. Um, we're only displaying a, a, a subset of the proteins uh, and molecules that are within this cluster. So I mentioned on Thursday that this, when uh, microtubules are undergoing dynamic instability, this, uh, this catastrophic disassembly event, that they, they literally peel away from one another, right? They're not just disassemble or go into solution. They're literally going to peel away. And there's some critical aspects of the kinetic core that are going to utilize that feature of microtubules to help drive, uh, generate force in order to separate those chromosomes. So this is a pretty cool structure. I really like it because it's also thought to be mechanosensitive. Right? So you can imagine, right, that uh, let's say I have one chromosome and I have one uh, um, um, microtubule that connects to one side of the chromosome, right? And if this structure has no way to sense if the opposite side is connected, then it might pull both chromosomes, right, both copies of that chromosome into one of the daughter cells. Now, one is diploid and the other one doesn't have any any of that chromosome in it, right? That would be bad. So what they think happens is that the chromosome assembles, you get this, the creation of this kinetic core, and that as it begins to pull on that chromosome, that, that there are mechanosensitive proteins that can detect if there's any resistance. So if there's no resistance, it will stop pulling. And it waits until now when both sides are connected and they start to pull, those proteins can sense the resistance, right, from the other side, and now they'll trigger a full, a full, um, this full mechanism. Does that make sense? So no one knows how this works. So I don't want you guys to be like, how does that work? Why isn't he telling us? No one really understands how this works yet. Uh, the tools are just now coming uh, into play that allow us to begin to explore this kind of behavior in proteins, and the idea of mechanotransduction and mechanically activated proteins is only something that's come about, let's say, in the last 15 years. So this is really new biology. All right, what's gonna happen, though, is that if we blow this, if you look into this region right here, there are a couple of interesting things. This dammel ring, uh, which is right here, and it's gonna sit around that microtubule. It's a ring structure. And so if I have a ring, let's say, around my two arms, and I start peeling them away, then that ring is going to start sliding down, right? Sliding down the microtubule. And it's connected structurally then to uh, the chromosome. So as it begins to peel away, the microtubule disassembly itself generates a particular force on, uh, on that centromere. Additionally, you can see, and we'll talk about um, not these specifically, but these right here in orange and these right here in blue that have these coil coils with these little head domains, those are molecular motors. We also have molecular motors that are generating force on that kinetic core in order to, uh, excuse me, that um, centromere in order to pull it apart, okay? All right, very interesting structure. Here's a movie of it in action, all right? So the chromosomal segregation, they're figuring out if the other side is connected and then you get this single once everything is connected, then they trigger, now pull, right? So part of that pulling is the disassembly. You can see the disassembly uh, of these um, um, 
oh my gosh. <laughs> uh, microtubules, yeah, yeah. Need another coffee, apparently. All right, okay. So if you can imagine, then uh, one of the hallmarks of cancer is unrelenting and unregulated mitosis. Cells divide, they divide, they divide, they divide, and you get a solid tumor. So it's not surprising, perhaps, that many of the chemotherapeutic drugs that we use are also anti-mitotics. So they're going to break the mitotic cycle. Okay? And many of the anti-mitotics are also inhibitors of microtubules in some way, inhibitors or stabilizers of, of microtubules. So here's one called vimblastin, causes tubulin aggregation. So in the pre-lecture, you learned that um, a microtubule is comprised of 13, subun 13 <coughs> subunits, right, that form that tube. And what vimblastin is going to do is it's going to cause aggregation. So instead of 13, I have approximately 20. It's not exactly 20. It's sometimes a little more, sometimes a little less. So you can imagine that dammel ring that has to sit around a 13 mer microtubule. Now, if I'm a fatter microtubule, that ring actually can't fit around that structure. And so you effectively lose the function of the kinetic core. Another one, nicotisol, it's going to promote microtubule depolymerization. So if I'm promoting depolymerization, I can never fully polymerize and get to uh, the centromere. Right? So if I prevent that connection from ever happening, uh, then I can never uh, pull, those, pull those chromosomes apart. Taxol is an important one, still used today. It stabilizes, stabilizes microtubules. So now I've maybe made these connections to the centromere, but I can't depolymerize, and so I still can't split those chromosomes apart into daughter cells. All of these events are, are, are blockades to mitosis and will trigger something known as apoptosis. Does anyone remember what apoptosis is? Yeah? Um, it's programmed cell death. Programmed cell death as opposed to um, necrosis, which is non-programmed cell death, something like UV irradiation or physical damage, right? The cell did not program me to hit it over and over again. Yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, many of these products were actually originally identified in plants. Uh, periwinkle, deer won't eat it. One of the reasons is it has a really cool mechanism, defense mechanism, which is if you eat enough of it, you will die because it stops mitosis uh, within the body. Uh, they're very structurally complicated, but they're actually uh, synthesized. Um, they're, they're created synthetically now. Okay. Any questions on, um, on microtubules at this point? Doesn't mean you can't have them later, but okay. All right. So I mentioned we're not going to talk about intermediate filaments. They're sort of like the redheaded stepchild of the, of the cytoskeletal world. We, um, they, 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 they get ignored, unfortunately, right? Um, all right, so we're going to talk instead about actin filaments. <laughs> I, I always look and I always miss my redheads in the crowd when I say that. <laughs> like, oh, oops. All right, so, um, so we're going to talk about actin filaments. Uh, they were described as also microfilaments. You will, if you're reading the literature, you will not see microfilament. It's just not a widely used term. What you will see is actin or actin filaments. And actin, unfortunately, comes in both globular and fibrillar form. And we don't, in the literature, a lot of times you will see authors not designate one or the other. They'll say, oh, the actin cytoskeleton. What they're implying when they say the actin cytoskeleton is the fibrillar component. It's just, if they're talking about globular, they'll be specific. If they're talking about filamentous, it'll tend to default into actin. So it's just a, a nuance I want you guys to be uh, cognizant of as you're reading literature. All right, so what we're going to do is do a little compare and contrast with, um, with microtubules, OK? So unlike microtubules, these are oftentimes not stabilized, right? There's no, the, the negative end is, is unable to undergo polymerization, as is the positive end, OK? So they may or may not be stabilized by one end or the other in living cells, or both ends may be free. 
And this is going to be done through accessory proteins that cap either the negative end or the plus end. Okay? As opposed to something like the microtubules that have this microtubule organizing center where all the negative ends are and all the positives are radiating out from that spot. Okay? All right. So while microtubules and tubulin is a GDPase, actin is an ATPase. And I'm going to mess this up. I do it every single year. I'm going to say GTP here. So just realize that if I'm talking about actin and I accidentally say GTP, I mean ATP, okay? It's just, I don't know. I study GDPases for my PhD and it just rolls off the tongue. All right. So let's talk a little bit of some anatomy of the actin microfilaments. Um, so we have, a, again, similar to a microtubule, we have a plus end. Uh, this is where uh, the, uh, the globular actin or the actin participating in the fiber is ATP bound, just like it would be GTP bound in the case of tubulin. Uh, and as you progress to the negative end, uh, that ATP begins to take on an ADP character due to that ATP ACE activity of actin. Okay? There's a negative end of the microfilament, similarly. You will also see them called the plus end called the barbed end, and the negative end called the pointed end. I apologize, this is just biology, so people are making observations. Uh, at the cell biological level or the structural biological level and not necessarily the biochemical level. And so as actin was begun, uh, began to be described, what they noticed was in EM images is that one end looked like a barbed end and one end looked like a pointed end. And so they would literally describe what they saw. Right? In fact, right, a cell came from the observations of cork. right? And the visual representation of what cork looks like is they look like large open cells, right? And now all of a sudden we call everything a cell. But it was actually the observation, the, the physical look of cork that led to the term cells, which is kind of interesting. All right. Okay. Again, uh, let's see. All right. So if I, can, if I tell you that, let's say, neither end is protected, so neither end is stabilized, and we get polymerization on the negative end, and we get polymerization on the positive end, but polymerization on the positive end is always going to proceed faster than polymerization on the negative end. What does this imply about the critical concentration of our two ends? Yes? It's lower on the positive end. It's lower on the positive end, OK? Because the amount of globular actin is the same, right, within the cell. So if we're polymerizing faster on the positive end, the KC has to be lower, okay? All right, so here it is in text form. The plus end grows faster than the negative end because the KC is lower at the positive end. And this leads effectively to the monomer tail binding to the polymer head, right? You might see that designation. Okay, in the filament, the ATPase activity of actin is activated, right? So only when it's in that filamentous form does the protein's ATPase activity kick in, okay? So you will not find globular actin in the cytoplasm actively converting its ATP into ADP, okay? All right. As a result, similar to the microtubule, the plus end has predominantly ATP monomers, and the negative end has uh, ADP monomers. The ATP hydrolysis, similar uh, to the microtubules, uh, is going to accentuate the differences in KC between the two ends. Okay? So as ATP, uh, as the G-actin or the filamentous actin has um, more of an ADP character on the plus end, that KC is going to slowly increase. It doesn't, it doesn't completely, it doesn't increase to the point where they're equivalent. The negative end is always going to have a higher KC than the plus end, but ATP drops that even further. Does that make sense? I said that in a kind of a wonky way. The other way to say that is the plus end always has a lower KC, 
And when the plus end is loaded with ATP versus ADP, it'll be even lower. Maybe that's a better way. Okay? Right. Okay. So instead of this dynamic instability and catastrophic disassembly that we see in the microtubules, actin display this process we call treadmilling. Okay? So if we have a fiber, here it is. If we have a fiber, this is the plus end. It's all ATP loaded, denoted by green. The ADP uh, is denoted by, uh, by blue. This is a negative end, right? So the KC here is much, uh, much higher. Uh, it leads to uh, potential shedding of um, or disassembly of the fiber on the, on the minus end. Here's our globular actin now in its ADP form. Similar to tub tubulin, it's going to shed that ADP and acquire a whole new ATP. This is not a phosphorylation event. All right. Now that ATP loaded G actin uh, can participate in active actin monomers uh, and polymerization on the plus end. Okay. All right. So one of the interesting things about G actin is that the calculations of how much you have in your cell, if it was completely unregulated, the amount of G-actin or the availability of G-actin was unregulated, your cells would be as stiff as this table, right? Because you would simply polymerize the vast amounts of actin and you would freeze, essentially harden your cells, okay? So as a consequence, we need to be able to regulate, we need to be able to buffer all that G actin so that it appears as if there's much less than there really is. What that allows us to do is very quickly respond to stimuli. And if I need to polymerize actin in a very specific direction, I'll locally activate or make available G actin in that region. And so that's why you might get a cell protrusion in one direction or the other is through these regulatory mechanisms. So we're not going to talk about all of them. There are so many, and this is what I did my PhD in. So it's, uh, it's, it's obnoxious how many of these uh, regulators there are. We're just going to talk about a few. So one is profilin that we would expect you to know. Uh, and profilin is going to act as a shuttle. And it's also going to promote nucleotide exchange, that exchange of the ADP for ATP. Remember, in the case of tubulin, I call these a guanidine exchange factor. This would be an adenosine exchange factor, adenosine, excuse me, exchange factor. Okay. All right. And the other is that of thymosin, which is a monomer buffer. It's going to buffer the amount of G-actin that's available for polymerization. So how does this work? All right. So here's our um, G-actin in ADP form. Profilin is going to bind to it and facilitate the exchange of ADP for ATP. And that's going to leave us with this very large store of active monomer ready to become a polymer. Again, if left to its own devices, it will very quickly form its own po form a polymer. So what we're going to do is it's going to bind to this molecule known as thymosin. And thymosin is going to sequester it in this active but unavailable state. Okay? So you can think about it like hiding, I don't know, hiding these tricks. They're still there, but they're hidden. Bad analogy. Anyway. All right. Um, this is a, um, this depends on the amount of G-actin and the amount of thymosin, right? Because the reaction is going in both, both directions. There's no catalysis here. It's protein A binds protein B. So it's that K on, K off that we talked about a lot when it came to enzyme kinetics, when it came to polymerization. It's the same thing. There's an on rate and an off rate, an association constant, a dissociation constant that <coughs> determines the concentrate, you know, the, the binding dynamics of, of those two molecules. All right. So when we have a triggered response, let's say a chemotactic gradient, uh, a neutrophil senses injury. So maybe a platelet is activated. You get platelet-derived growth factor. It forms a gradient. There's a neutrophil that's resident and says, oh, I need to move up this gradient. You get activation, and you get the release then of thymosin from uh, the, uh, the G-actin. And then profilin is now going to rebind it 
and act as a shuttle to bring it to, uh, to the growing actin filament. Okay? It's way more complicated than that, but here are two examples. Okay? If we go through and talk about a couple others, uh, just to think about other forms of actin regulation, cofillin is one that got a lot of uh, notoriety recently. Uh, well, recently meaning the last 10 years. It is another monomer buffer, but it's a monomer buffer for ADP G actin. So instead of sequestering the active form of G actin, it's going to sequester the inactive form of G actin. Uh, there's a molecule known as gel solin, and this is an actin severing protein. So it goes through and literally cleaves actin filaments. So if we need to disassemble very quickly, we can just start cleaving them. Uh, and then we have uh, these cross-linking proteins like alpha actinin and filament. Uh, they're branching proteins that help form, uh, help um, uh, inspire uh, branches. And we'll talk about one ARP23 when it comes to uh, listeria. Okay, so the not so mellow mushroom. This one has an appropriate name known as the death cap mushroom. It has a particular toxin called uh, phalotoxin, uh, or we also call it phalloidin in the lab. It's an actin stabilizer. We like it because it not only stabilizes, it binds to actin. And so there's a product in the lab that we use all the time that is phalloidin coupled with <coughs> Texas Red, which is a fluorescent probe. So if I hit it with one wavelength of light, it emits a different wavelength of light. And from that, I can start to visualize actin cytoskeleton. So when you see a really pretty picture of these really bright red actin filaments, that's usually, historically, Texas Red X phalloidin, right? That's, that's actually enabling us to image those. So it's a poison in some mushroom genera, uh, in particular uh, this one. Uh, it kills by stabilizing the actin filaments. So if, if I inhibit disassembly, again, what you're going to wind up doing is freezing the cell. The actin is how our cells uh, generate shape changes. And so if I need to move from point A to point B, and I've frozen all of my actin, I, I literally cannot move, right? The cell literally cannot move. All right. The immediate cause of death is liver failure. All right. Pretty mushroom. Don't eat. Yes? This causes like the cell to freeze. Uh, why is like one of the symptoms not like paralysis and rather liver failure? I think the liver fails before all that other stuff. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're gonna die. It's just that <laughs> this is the the path of least resistance to to that endpoint, right? The the activation energy <laughs> is lowest in the liver, maybe. Yeah. All right. Okay. Other really interesting molecules, cytochalazin. Uh, this is actually an actin filament destabilizer, also uh, found in mushrooms. Um, and so it's really interesting. We use this in the lab. If I want to, if I want to study how the cytoskeleton infect, affects certain behaviors, uh, let's say I have a really uh, highly spread cell, I can give it cytochalazin, and immediately the cell will round up into a small circle. Um, cytochalazin, we play tricks with cytochalazin. There's another one called latrunculin A. And we're really interested in transcription factors that are directly associated with the cytoskeleton. So during polymerization, the, uh, the transcription factors are released from G actin and go into the nucleus and trigger transcriptional changes. So it's like how, shape how cells can change their transcriptional program based on whether they're sitting on a nice, soft, cushy chair or a hard surface, their transcript, the proteins that they'll, they'll make are different, right? So they actually have responsiveness to environmental substrate mechanics. And one way they do that is these transcription factors that are linked to the actin cytoskeleton. So you can play really cool tricks with a lot of these toxins where uh, in the case of cytochalazin, it destabilizes actin and releases MRTF, myocardin-related transcription factor, Latrunculin A will depolymerize actin, but it holds MRTF on the G-actin um, monomer. And so you can play tricks with cells to get them to do different things based on these toxins. 
So these are pretty common, pretty common approaches in, in experimental biology. All right, so what is the actin useful for? Well, shape change. It is the cytoskeletal element that defines what shape your cells are in, okay? Um, we'll look at two structures here. One is called lamellipodia. So podia, feet, lamellar, sheet, right? So this is a sheet-like foot projection, right? <laughs> All right, so this is a lamellipodia. You see that? It looks like a nice big flat sheet, and you'll see it. It'll roll and roll. It'll just keep moving forward. Now we'll see those here in just a minute. The other is one called a pseudopodia. Pseudopodia, you guys have had like high school bio, right? What is a characteristic? What is the characteristic organism that people look at when they think of a pseudopodia or when they're studying pseudopodia? Anyone like trivia night? It's Friday. Come on. You're about to win your team. Yes. Amoeba. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, when you study amoebas in high school bio, right, their mode of migration is amoeboid migration uses something called a pseudopodia, right? What's interesting is that we now find one of my good buddies was at the NIH. He's now at Drexel. They found that mammalian cells will also use some really wonky uh, mechanisms uh, to generate these things called pseudo pseudopodia through confined domains. They'll actually use the nucleus as a piston to literally push the membrane and bled it out, and then the cell will pull itself along. It's pretty, pretty crazy, yeah. All right, so actin filament growth is nucleated and pushes, I'm gonna put that in quotes, pushes on the membrane, because we're gonna talk about that here in a minute. Examples are the crawling of cancer cells, immune cells, pretty much anything. So here are a bunch of different cell types um, that are moving along. Here's a mouse fibroblast. You can see the sort of fluctuations and ripples. That's, um, that's the membrane sort of rippling as the uh, actin is polymerizing up underneath. This is a fish keratinocyte. It's very classical lamellipodial type of migration. That's more of a, uh, I think in 3D, this would look much more like a pseudop pseudopod, a pseudopodial. There's one that is not on here, and so I won't, I don't think I test you on it because it's not in blue and it's not on here. Uh, which is called a philopodia. So it's another structure that you'll see in the literature, whereas a lamellipodia is a sheet-like protrusion. A philopodia is a filamentous-like, foot-like protrusion. So it'll be a little spike that comes out. And if you look hard enough on some of, maybe on this face, they're moving pretty fast, these videos, you might be able to see some philopodia like right in here in those little areas, it's these little spike-like projections. Okay, so we haven't talked about, we've talked about endothelium, uh, epithelium and an epithelial cell. We have not talked about a fibroblast, or at least I don't think I have. Have I talked about a fibroblast yet? Does anyone know what a fibroblast is? Okay, does anyone want to guess what a fibroblast is? Okay, so a fibroblast is, I mentioned that in the body you have multiple cell types, large classifications of cells. One is this epithelial cell, and the other is this fibroblast or mesenchymal cell, right? So I'll modify this and I'll add a note. A mesenchymal cell, also known as a stromal cell, is a cell, instead of its primary mode of adhesion being cell-cell contact, it's a cell matrix contact, right? So remember, Epithelial cells are um, gregarious. They love each other. They're going to hold hands. And a fibroblast is the loner that's way out in space uh, and interacting with the extracellular matrix that we'll talk about. The fibroblast is one is a specialized cell within this class of mesenchymal cells. Okay. All right. Okay. So we're right on time. In fact, a little bit early. So that's good. So. I told you we were going to talk about some branching proteins. And so we're going to focus on ARP23. All right. So ARP23 um, and WASP uh, are really important for making uh, branch points, right? So if all we had were these little sticks, right? You can imagine if I'm polymerizing uh, actin and it's coming up against the membrane, if I only have one fiber, there's a 
good chance I'll poke a hole in it, right? But now if I branch, 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 I increase the surface area, right? I increase, uh, I decrease the tension on the membrane by instead of having one point of contact, I have many, many points of contact, okay? And so what this is gonna enable the cell to do is to move really large um, bits of its membrane into space without, without the threat of puncturing the cell membrane. Okay, so where you find ARP23 is almost always at um, the edge of a cell, although we'll see some EMs where you see cells that are um, very, very branched uh, uh, act inside a skeleton. So ARP23 is very important for making branching points on actin filaments. They're going to also, also nucleate new filament growth, and this will be important when we talk about listeria. WASP is this key activator of ARP23 that itself is activated by cell surface receptors. So again, I have a stimulus, some type of growth factor, some type of chemokine that wants, that is drawing the cell, right, attracting the cell in a certain direction. On that side of the cell, those receptors will be activated and trigger the activation of WASP and ARP23 to begin branching its actin cytoskeleton on that side. Okay, so signal transduction through receptors, through cell surface membrane receptors, then leads to the activation of cytoskeletal elements that allow the cell to change its shape in response to external stimuli. Okay, all right, so I said I was going to put the word push in quotes, uh, and you should. You should put the word push in quotes, because the actin, remember, it's going to polymerize fastest on the plus end, and let's just say, for all intents and purposes, my actin is abutted to the membrane. So if I'm not generating some type of force on the fiber itself to push it against the membrane, somehow it's the polymerization that is driving the membrane to move. And so you can imagine if it's, and this is an idealized case, if my actin is right up against my membrane, there's no space for another monomer, right? So the push is really what we call a Brownian wrench. And it's kind of interesting. Anyone know what Brownian motion is? Okay, Brownian motion is just the motion from the thermodynamic energy that's in a system, okay? So nothing sits perfectly still. It's always wiggling and jiggling, right? It's like my dog's a little bit tense or something like that. It's always shaking, right? So the membrane is also doing that. Right? There's a certain amount of thermodynamic energy in biology, in biological systems, organisms, that's allowing the fiber is wiggling and the membrane is wiggling. And so what's going to happen is the push is that you get a little bit of Brownian motion between these two things and now all of a sudden they're separated. And if I'm activating and I have huge amounts of readily available active um, globular actin in that space, now I'm gonna add a monomer, right? And so now instead of it toggling, it, its vibrations going back to this place, it's gonna go back to here, right? Because I've added another monomer to the end. So the push is really this, and this is what we mean by a Brownian wrench, is where the bi biology is gonna use natural fluctuations in structure, uh, natural fluctuations, um, yeah, in structure in order to drive motion. Okay, and we see it time and time again. All right, so um, some key aspects. Um, ARP23 is always going to generate this 70 degree angle. Has to do with the specific structure of ARP23, how it's going to bind existing actin filaments, and where the position of its actin polymerization nucleation site is. Okay. So it's just a characteristic of ARP23 complex itself, okay? All right. okay. I think that's it. Any questions on that for now? Okay. All right. So let's get back then to our disease state. Oh, sorry. Here's the EM. So this is uh, an EM image of an actin cytoskeleton within a cell. And this is important for you to contextualize what it really looks like. The reality is that if I use something like phalloidin, 
I will never see this. This will come out, panel A will look like a red haze when I look at it under a light microscope. It's only at the EM level that we can actually begin to see that this is a million and one branching points, right? So it's not these individual fibers that are all pushing up against the membrane. It's a huge, vast network of fibers, of little fibers that are all together kind of pushing on the membrane um, at the surface, okay? And this is actually a blow up of that. C is a blow up of this area in A. So many, many teeny tiny fibers. If you can optically observe actin uh, with a light microscope, then it's actually what we call a stress fiber. It's where actin has begun to bundle, bundle, bundle to a point where I can actually see it with the eye. Okay? All right. Okay. So how does Listeria get its actin tail? Remember that comet tail we talked about in the very beginning? That when they did these images, they saw this sort of gray haze behind uh, the Listeria? Well, it's actually going to hijack our own actin polymerization system. So in the case of Listeria, it has this protein called ACT-A uh, that I mentioned. Uh, it enters the cell via different mechanisms. When it gets into the cell, part of its maturation is the expression of this protein ACT-A, and it expresses it and displays it on the surface of the bacterium only on the posterior end. Okay. And so what this is going to do then, uh, what ACT-A is, is um, this uh, ARP23, has an ARP23 and this VASP, this proline-rich repeat, which binds one of the WASP family members called VASP. And so what it's going to do is it's going to bring this branching protein, our own protein that, that triggers actin branching and actin polymerization, and its activator uh, in this, um, in this um, discrete area behind the cell. Uh, so propylin, right? We talked about propylin. It's bound to the, the active uh, actin monomer. It's going to be recruited to VASP. It's going to facilitate polymerization. And so what, what the bacteria is literally doing is generating all these little actin filament fragments, filaments, right, on the back end. It's not pushing the bacteria, right? It's using the same thing, this Brownian motion, right? So if you look at bacteria in a microscope, they're always jiggling, right? And what this one is doing is it's leveraging that and the really fast polymerization dynamics of actin to push itself forward. All right, so it's going to recruit ARP23, which is going to recruit actin profiline complex and generate um, these little actin filamentous fragments. Uh, what you see in here, uh, this is alpha actinin. We talked about alpha actinin in one of the prior, prior slides. And these are stabilizing uh, proteins that are going to uh, link two filaments together and, and stabilize the actin cytoskeleton. So it's got, it's utilizing, basically, it, it hijacks our, our cytoskeleton to generate motion. All right, so the treatment for listeriosis. Again, for all of us that are healthy, we just need time. Uh, obviously, if I'm immunocompromised, I'll need probably a broad spectrum antibiotic. Okay? So antibiotics for immune compromised people and pregnant women. Prevention is always best. Avoid soft cheeses with unpasteurized milk. Uh, these are my favorites, so it's unfortunate. Uh, avoid refrigerated meat, um, unrefrigerated meat, sorry, <laughs> unrefrigerated meat and fish. <laughs> so you should always eat room temperature fish and meat. <laughs> I'm kidding, I'm kidding. All right, proper food safety and hygiene. Wow, that's actually made it now three years. That's the first time I've seen that. Oops, all right. Okay, if you're interested in the cytoskeleton migration, uh, you're, you're in what was the epicenter for cell migration research. Uh, UVA was the home of the, the NIH's Cell Migration Consortium in the early part of the 2000s. This is where all the preeminent work was done on focal adhesion biology, on uh, cell cytoskeleton, on cell migration. A lot of those folks have retired, a lot of those folks have moved on, but you guys are, you guys are in what, what was the epicenter. There's still a number of folks that are around. 
Uh, the top three, Jim Casanova in cell biology, looks at ARC23 complex uh, and how that impacts cancer metastasis, cancer cell migration. Doug D. Simone is interested in um, the cytoskeleton mechanobiology of developing systems. So he uses um, Xenopus, so the frog, uh, and development of the frog to study how cytoskeletal interactions drive these very large tissue morphogenic events. Uh, Dorothy Schaefer over in biology is a fundamental actin uh, biochemist. Um, myself uh, in BME. Uh, let's see, other folks in. Um, I think um, uh, Brian Helmke is interested in this. Uh, Will Guilford, a lot of, a lot of folks uh, are studying this uh, in this area. So reach out to us if you're interested. And uh, I will see you on Thursday. Don't forget my office hours tomorrow are gonna be from like 8.30-ish to 10, maybe come 9 to 10.